Hi everyone, and welcome to, okay, and welcome to another edition, right? So I wanted to talk about uh, a, a goodie, an oldie but goodie that I think everyone should read is Up From Slavery and by Booker T. Washington. Uh, Booker T. Washington is one of those people that is, you know, he was born in slave and he went through reconstruction as a boy and he lived all his life in the South. I think the furthest North he got, he was, was in Virginia. And then there are moments where he does visit, uh, you know, Washington. And he, of course, eventually he travels around the world speaking. Well, I wouldn't say around the world, I'll just say to Europe. Uh, a lot of people talk about Booker T. Washington at the same time that they talk about W.B. Du Bois. W.B. Du Bois was born in the North. He was born free. And I think, and then let's, let's drop a dime and say that we also have discussions of Frederick Douglass. And Frederick Douglass is usually paired in your English classes, uh, you usually read Frederick Douglass and then you probably are assigned the life of Frederick Douglass. Um, and then you probably are assigned up from slavery in which I was as an undergrad. And I think back to the fact that this was an assignment that I read back in undergrad that was taught by a white instructor. And I don't understand how I kind of tolerated and lived through some of this trauma because it is trauma that's taking place um, because you're constantly, because Up From Slavery is a book that I'm not sure, and it's only 123 pages. I'm not sure how I feel about reading it in kind of like a, a mixed group of company. And I say this because Booker T. Washington evaluated slavery in a different way. He was definitely more um, gentle about the institution than someone like a Frederick Douglass. Booker T. is able to describe how slaves really loved their master and cared for their master. And he gives even descriptions of how their map, of how a, a man who was paying his debt for freedom continued to pay their debt even after the Emancipation Proclamation. He even goes into description of how um, slaves, the American slave trade uh, improved the lives of blacks versus their counterparts in other countries. And it's like, I'm sorry, this is his experience. So it's hard for me, I, 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 I wanna throw judgment but I wasn't born in that, in that time frame, And so part of me is like, and then when he is building to ski, the fact that you are traveling around giving these speeches in front of white folks, talking about how black people need to be taught how to be civilized. And, you know, and he even gives a description of using a toothbrush as that indicator of being civilized. It's like, I can't with this guy, <laughs> give me a break. But at, but at the time, and he also was like, the notion of, uh, we have to teach them how to bathe and teach them how to, um, you know, how to exist in this new civilized freedom. And we don't want education and then he even gives this whole long description of 
which is really shade to Du Bois, um, how these young people are being taught Latin and French, but they don't do hygiene. And we need to teach them how to be hygienic. And we also need to teach them more practical skills because think about all the skills that they had when they were slaves. Now they're free. You know, they, you, you, do you know that they, the person who really had no skills were the slave owners? It's the slaves that had all the skills because they did all the work. And so therefore we should take those skills and, and move the, and, te and refine them by showing them how to work the land and, and continue with these skills, but do it for yourself. You know, it's hard to read because I also understand that in the midst of his um, demeaning comments, he's trying to uplift. And he believes that he's doing it for the betterment of his people. He's willing to have white folks call him a good nigger as long as they're donating to Tuskegee Institute. Um, I admire how he builds Tuskegee and because um, he does it literally brick by brick. And I admire how much he's willing to put himself out there on the line to do all of this. I admire all this. And he gives his famous Atlanta speech about drop your bucket where you are. I'm paraphrasing. And this is the famous speech in which Du Bois has an issue and rightfully so, right? But <clears throat> I think of my family and I'm gonna get personal for a second. My grand, my great grandfather was born a slave and when he was in Texas, his job was to um, raise and tame horses. He was a horse whisperer. And my, when he left, he left to go to Indiana. I know, I know. And he settled in Terre Haute, Indiana. Um, and he was industrious. Like he was very industrious. He loved horses. He, um, you know, built, built a house. And uh, my grandfather, because both of them became landowners, like a lot, they owned quite a bit of land around the um, around Terre Haute, Indiana. And my grandfather worked at a plant in which he lived across the street. If you go there now, the, the plant that he worked at, he was an engineer, right? And at the time, you know, engineers don't get a degree. It's an apprentice kind of a thing. That's how you became an engineer. And um, it's, it's now just a vacant, a, a very, very large vacant plot of land. The grass is growing, so it couldn't have been that tra tragic. <laughs> um, and he also was a contractor for Sears. Sears, you used to buy your house in a, in a magazine and they deliver your house. You had to have somebody build it. He was a private contractor. He believed highly in education. Um, he never, he didn't go to college, but he did go and get all these certificates. So he was certified to be, he didn't just believe in just going out and like doing it on your own. He believed in you need to be certified in everything. And if you're gonna do it, you do it well. So, I mean, he didn't even, you know, he he's, was constantly working. Uh, my mother, he had ten, they had 10 kids. My mother was the fourth from the last. And she was born in 1949, framework, right? 
the reason why I'm giving you a date here is because I want you to realize like they were much of much of her family was born. All of them were born before Brown v. Board of Education. <laughs> but much of her um, family went to segregated schools. The only one who did, wasn't raised throughout all of segregation was the youngest son. They all played sports. She was the only girl. They all played sports. And um, two of the kids died at near birth um, within their first year. So the eight that remained, they all played sports. My mother, there were no girl sports in, in her city. So she didn't, so they didn't focus on her when it came to sports and thinking that she could join a team. She wanted to play tennis and swimming. Interestingly enough, um, the history of swimming and blacks, one of the reasons why blacks aren't in swimming as much is because of the history and the history has nothing to do with our hair. It has much to do with the fact that swimming pools is one of the last things that integrated. And uh, so there's no culture of swimming. However, in Indiana, you had to learn how to swim in order to graduate from high school. So blacks had access to pools, um, even public pools. Uh, anywho, my grandfather would not, did not want two things, his kids to get into politics. So the protesting thing was not his thing. And part of it was because you have to remember the context of Emmett Till. And Emmett Till was a real vivid thing. Um, you also have to remember that uh, he also, number two, if someone were to call you nigger, you take it. Do not get into a fight. And so my, my uncle one time, when he, when he was in high school, that's when he first integrated, got into a fight because someone did. Came home, his father was like, what happened? And his father whooped him. And one of the reasons, I mean, they were so good in sports. One of them was in, in is in the, the Hall of Fame in track and field. One of them went to University of Michigan to play football on a scholarship, the oldest. Um, he was a quarterback in high school, but you know, you don't become quarterbacks, black quarterback in the, in the, in the early fifties, late forties. Yeah, early 50s. Um, <laughs> so just dazzling sports. All of them had sports scholarships. All of them, so one of them, uh, I mean, dazzling in sports. But discrimination and racism. I, I call racism a spirit killer, a dream killer. It is a dream killer. It makes you bitter. It hurts and cuts people's souls. And I've seen it in my own family. And I've seen it in myself and sometimes. So I say that to say that the reason why my grandfather felt so strongly that they had to just kind of take it, not embrace it is because it's a strong, it's a survival. There is a strong possibility that someone could have came and knocked on their, no, not knock, came into their house, take his son and lynch him. It's a strong possibility. It is a survival issue. So I understand Booker T. Washington. This is survival. I am teaching my people how to 
uplift themselves in the midst of spaces that aren't as free as and, and can just sit in and study, you know, Latin. Ironically, that was ironically. And this is the reason why I get angry when I hear people talk about segregated schools. Segregated schools, um, in black schools, you had a lot of black teachers and these black teachers in today's realm could have been, are really scholars. They, they traveled the world. They, uh, they had master degrees to teach. So they were really skilled and in these segregated schools that my mother, kid, my mother and her uncles went to, not only did they learn about all the other things, history, math, blah, 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 but they learned Latin, a second language and they learned, they were taught Latin and Greek and sometimes French, right? They, they were taught this. And um, my mother became a Latin major, Latin and political science major. Uh, and that was, Latin was just a part of the curriculum in junior high and high school. Everyone took it. So it's just kind of a, a strange space to hear people talk about how bad segregated schools were because even if they were all in the same room, they were still learning. You know why? Because teachers cared about their students. They loved them. And this was an uplift the race moment. So I get Booker T. Washington's level of survival. I understand him and I understand that he wants to teach them basic skills to exist, but he also doesn't see the Du Bois side, which is they also need to dream bigger than their current existence. There's more than a dusty road. Like there's more than, than just this. If they, if they wanted to, to do more than just this. And so the notion of, I have to teach them etiquette. And so this is why I also have problems with people talking about Du Bois and respectability, respectability politics um, is because respectable is that respectability politics means that black people need to be the best self. They need to be best represented. They need to be best groomed. They need to do all these best practices um, because it is a, uh, they need to do all of these best things because it, it is, the thing that will, um, because then maybe whites will treat you better. And, we, and he gives this ex example of, he started a, Tuskegee started the best, uh, a really good practice in making bricks. And it, it was going so well that he wanted to demonstrate how if you make the best bricks, then even white people have to buy from you, and wish they did. And then if they're buying from you, then they respect you. And it's like, well, I can give you so many examples that this doesn't work, but okay. But that's what respectability politics is. And I struggle with people talking about Du Bois argument of respectability politics because he does argue it, but not in the same way. He's looking at it from more political will, like if you support their issues and you, we can build alliances, but I'm not sure if he's looking for, especially later in his life, he's like, look, it ain't possible that we don't get together. <laughs> and how about you do you, white people? I do me, I'm leaving America, I'm done with you. Um, but Booker T has this idea like, oh, we can just all be together 
and we can respect each other. I mean, he is the definition, quintessential respectability politics. And it is a difficult read in, in my mind. I understand it, but I just struggle. So I think that it's important for you to read Up From Slavery and have these thoughts. But I'm gonna leave one takeaway. Frederick Douglass said, and I'm, a, I'm, I'm using this, and this is a snap moment. Frederick Douglass, somebody said, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to disagree, you know, that, that he, somebody told him that I didn't mean that to be um, degrading to you. And he's like, I'm sorry, you can't degrade me. You can't degrade Mr. Douglas. It's not possible to degrade Mr. Douglas. Because when you degrade, when you're attempt to degrade me, all you're doing is degrading yourself. And I said, say that, Mr. Douglas. And that's true. When you're disrespecting me, you're disrespecting yourself. You're not disrespecting. It's not possible. Because he's saying like, I'm so on, I'm a be a Jay-Z reference. I'm so off that. You do you. I'm doing me. I'm so off of your disrespect. And that's where we're at. Um, go check it out. It's a really short read. You should just consider it. Open your mind to it. Like I said, have a great afternoon.